if yesterday was about Santa and a Santa rally, today was about the Grinch. This market, completely different in Europe compared to what's taking place in the United States. In the United States, the Chairman Powell inspired rally for a sixth day on the S&P 500, up a half of 1%. It's not what you heard from Lagarde today. That's not important. It's what you didn't hear. This was not a repeat of Chairman Powell. The ECB is moving at its own speed, and it is not ready to discuss easing policy. Take a listen to what Christine Lagarde had to say. No. We should absolutely not lower guard. When we look at all the measurements of underlying inflations, there is one particular measurement which is hardly budging. It's, it's declining a little bit, but not much. And that is domestic inflation. We need more data. We need to understand better what happens there. And why is domestic inflation resisting? Let's get straight over to Frankfurt, Germany, with Bloomberg's Maria. Today, out. Maria, this was not Chairman Powell, Volume Two. Uh, no, it was not. And, and Jonathan, you and I talked about this when the statement uh, hit uh, about two hours ago, and we said there's nothing in it that would suggest uh, this is a European Central Bank that wants to match uh, the Fed in any way. And I think when you look at that press conference, it's double clear that was not the intention. The head of the ECB uh, made it very clear they had not debated internally uh, the idea of cuts. Uh, it was not a topic that was up for discussion at all. That was a quote. Uh, she also said this is a central bank that is data dependent. Again, that is a reference to this idea that it cannot follow the Fed. It looks said its own data and to me it was also very clear from the language uh, that she used that they want to stretch the theme of higher for longer for as long as possible. Remember, she said, you don't go from hiking to cutting. There is life in between. The question is for how long can you credibly maintain uh, that higher for longer narrative? But again, the bottom line is that if you were hoping for any clues or any pivot that would look like the Fed, well, you didn't get that in this press conference. This was a Christine Lagarde that made it clear no cuts have been debated. And in the meantime, the European Central Bank will look at data, especially at the start of the year. Remember, she talked about a bulk of new data they're expecting and the cut of data, the forecast. Uh, for this month that would assess the future steps forward. No mention of cuts. And again, this idea that higher policy is sufficiently restrictive. They really want to milk this higher for longer theme for as long as they possibly can. Hey, Maria, great update, great roundup throughout this morning. Maria today out there in Frankfurt, Germany at ECB HQ. Here stateside in New York, about four minutes into the session, the rally advances another six-tenths of one percent. We add some more weight to this big move on the Nasdaq, up another 0.7 percent, and the rust of the small caps have been absolutely flying. To discuss, Invesco's Alessio De Longis, Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites. Winnie, in some ways, that was some pushback from President Lagarde. How credible was that pushback? We think it was pretty credible, and we have long expected that the Fed is going to be cutting rates before the ECB because there are structural issues within the European and the UK economies that are likely to leave inflation higher than in the US, even as those economies slow a bit more than what we are expecting. And so we do think that the ECB is going to need to be uh, quite hawkish, or at least more hawkish than what at least the market was pricing in for an extended period of time versus the Fed, which does have a little bit more of that ability to shift to real policy rates, keeping things in restrictive territory, but not necessarily incrementally tightening policy. Let's get straight to the market moves. Big moves again this morning, up another 2.7 percent on the rust sort of small caps, absolutely flying. In the bond market, the rally continues. In the Treasury market, again, it's fade a touch, but still stick. Yield to lower at the front end by five basis points, 4.38. Alessio, you've been overweight, constructive on risk throughout the whole of this year. What's changed for you in the last 24 hours? Uh, well, thank you for the for the note, John. Yes, especially since the early summer, we have been positioning for with high conviction for this Goldilocks type of scenario: falling inflation, improving growth, albeit low growth, but improving growth and stable unemployment. What has changed? Well, we simply got validated by the economic data and most importantly by policymakers, by central banks. So uh, what's changing is the pricing, right? November was an, an impressive rally for risk assets, both in absolute and relative terms to safer asset classes. December is on course to repeat that. 
um, I would say that where we see more room to run is exactly the trade that you or the assets that you highlighted. Smaller capitalization stocks, mid caps, small caps, value oriented sectors. There is so much room to close the gap relative to high quality mega mega cap tech, especially in the US. Uh, where that that rotation, I think, still has room to run, both from a cyclical perspective and from a valuation perspective. A dose of decent data this morning as well. Let's get the roundup, mm -hmm. the update from Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, it was good news overall for the markets because the American consumer is still spending. Retail sales come in up three-tenths more than anticipated and making up for a decline, a revised decline in the month of October. Uh, retail sales control also up strongly, suggesting that people are out spending for their holiday purchases. Excuse me. Uh, jobless claims come in at 202, uh, much lower than anticipated, but uh, this is the time of year when those get distorted. But the message is still the same. The labor market is okay, and our latest inflation indicator, import prices, shows a decline. So where does this leave us? Well, the market is not wrong in thinking the Fed is going to be cutting rates. The question is, are they going to be wrong in how much rates get cut and how fast? Take a look at the second column from the left there, which is 2024, and you can see why while they lowered their forecast by about 75 basis points for next year, the dispersion among the members of the committee is still pretty wide. They aren't sure exactly what they're going to do or when they're going to do it. And though we paid a lot of attention to what was going on in 25 and 26, the dispersion there, even wider. And you notice there is one person at the top of each of those years who doesn't <laughs> think rates are going to really come down at all. We don't know who that is, but that's going to be a fun guessing game for the markets going forward. Uh, finally, we'll take a look at uh, where we are with the uh, Fed funds futures. It's a very neat picture, shows uh, continual decline. And up through January of 2025, the market now thinks you're going to get seven rate cuts. That wow. Might be a little aggressive, but as a lot of analysts said this morning, uh, the market tends to overreact and it may come back some. Uh, but at this point, uh, the idea that rates will be cut and relatively soon has legs. We're looking at the prospect of all time highs at a close on the Nasdaq. Mike McKee, thank you. I want to talk about two completely different people with apparently two very different views. And I'm not talking about Lagarde and Powell, I'm talking about Powell and Powell. Chairman Powell, December 1. It would be premature to speculate on when policy might ease. Twelve days later, same chairman, different man apparently. The question of when it will become appropriate to begin dialing back the amount of policy restraint in place is clearly a topic of discussion now in the world and also a discussion for us at our meeting. So, Winnie Caesar, I would ask you, what's changed in 12 days for this Fed chair? Well, I would ask the same question because we were very surprised by the dovish tone that Powell struck at this press conference yesterday. We had anticipated a Fed that was going to remain in quite hawkish messaging up until the very day that they actually cut rates. So to kind of preview the dis discussion came as a surprise to us because I think that the last thing the Fed wants to do is loosen up financial conditions really materially ahead of a rate cut and potentially you know, bring another round of inflation. But perhaps the way that the Fed is now viewing things is that sitting in overly restrictive territory for an extended period of time presents a greater risk than the potential risk of a stagflation type scenario. Alessia, what was it for you? What was behind the change? Well, I, maybe the uh, we had a few data points, particularly inflation, both the surveys and an actual inflation data points that did surprise to the downside, both in the U.S. and globally. And we know in real time what commodity prices are doing. And oil, uh, oil prices, energy prices have fallen by 20% in the last two months cumulative. And central bankers know mark to market in real time how that will feed directionally into their forecast or future actual inflation prints. So one version, one, one theory, one answer to your question could be uh, a, a U-turn based on this mark-to-market on the economic data that gave them more confidence. Uh, or maybe uh, we should be worried about this type of U-turn and, and be suspicious that uh, Chair Powell, as well as the ECB, may actually rebalance their language over the next few weeks. Uh, maybe that's the lesson to be learned here. Let's not extrapolate too far. We've reset the bar. 
quite high. Winnie, overweight investment grade and high yield for you going into year end and into 2024. Do you worry about how quickly we've reset the bar? I do worry about how quickly we've reset the bar, especially as in January we'll have conversations around another government shutdown, U.S. budget, the fiscal side of things. All of those topics are probably going to result in a little bit of a bout of risk off. We have a lot of technicals on the seasonal side of things that would drive us to expect a, a pretty positive December. And that's not, you know, coming a, as a, a particularly big surprise. But looking ahead into 2024, it's not going to be a straight line to our year end spread targets. We might get there and then give something up. And we are identifying these different pockets of volatility and, and kind of the, the mid-January timeframe as investors come back from the holiday season and realize, man, we have a long way to go before the Fed actually even starts cutting rates. It, it's definitely going to be an interesting time. You can't help but laugh. We're hitting year-end price targets for next year, this year, before getting to the end of 2023. Alessio, I'm looking at America. I'm looking at a market through 4,700. Goldman have got a 4,700 price target for year-end next year, by the way. Already there. I've got no idea what happens in the next 12 months, but I can sum up the last 24 hours. We've got decent data, retail sales, jobless claims. I've just heard from a Fed chair who's ready to talk about cutting interest rates maybe as soon as March based on the indications we got at the news conference yesterday. And let's see, I'm starting to think about where I want to be geographically, which regions I want to place money, move away from money market funds. And let's see, why on earth would I want to go to Europe right now, given what I just heard in that news conference? Well, it's a very good point, because if there is one element that has changed with, with the combination of the last two press conferences, that we have clearly opened the possibility for a dollar weakening cycle to set at the beginning of 2024. Uh, with the ECB lagging behind the Fed in terms of interest rate cuts, at least from their intentions. I would say that the ECB is in a very comfortable position because if the, if the Fed does deliver cuts in front of it, will ease financial conditions for the ECB without the ECB doing anything and maintaining a yield differential in favor of the euro. So a dollar downtrend uh, would contribute to that argument in favor of equities outside of the US, particularly Europe. And I will add one more thing. We talked earlier about the implications of a Goldilocks scenario for cyclical stocks, cyclical sectors, and cyclical styles. That is a highly uh, uh, supportive environment for European stocks that screen much more on the smaller capitalization characteristics and value-oriented characteristics relative to quality of mega cap tech in the US. So that would be my case for going to Europe, both from a currency perspective, from a cyclical perspective, and evaluation perspective. I think it can be the biggest surprise of 2024. Alessio, we've had many surprises through 2023 already. Alessio, Winnie, to the two of you, thank you. Have a wonderful Christmas, and thanks for catching up with us as we leave behind the last ECB rate decision of the year and the last decision for the Federal Reserve as well. 14 minutes into the session, we had some more weight to this monster rally of the last couple of months on the S&P 500 up by 0.6 percent on the Nasdaq up by three quarters of one percent on the composite 0.5 percent on the Nasdaq 100 the Russell the standout winner here the small caps higher by three percentage points coming up on this program House Republicans authorizing an impeachment inquiry into President Biden House Republicans who are been who've been <laughs> who have been really pushing, uh, pushing this impeachment without any evidence, like without be doing this political stunt. I mean, that's what they've been doing over and over again. This is new polling shows Donald Trump taking the lead across all seven swing states. That conversation up next. Republicans who are been who've been <laughs> who have been really pushing uh, pushing this impeachment without any evidence like without be doing this political stunt I mean that's what they've been doing over and over again I think uh, we've made our point very clear today evidence uncovered uh, has shown a very disturbing trend by the Biden family we've spent months in this investigation accumulating evidence 
It's a tough morning for the sitting president. GOP lawmakers voting to escalate an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. The president pushing back, saying, quote, instead of doing their job on the urgent work that needs to be done, they're choosing to waste time on this baseless political stunt. This is the latest Bloomberg Morning Consult poll shows Trump pulling ahead in Michigan with Biden losing support from key demographics. Your team coverage begins right now. AMH here in New York, Kelly Lines in D.C. Anne-Marie, another tough poll. This is a tough poll, and for our poll, alongside with Morning Consult, this is our third survey, and what we found is that Trump was able to flip Michigan in this poll. That hasn't, we haven't seen that before. So Biden is now losing in all of these key swing states, and the issue is he's losing support for some key demographics in his own party that voted for him. I'm thinking about black Americans, also women. The support has gone soft for him there, as well as young voters. And when it comes to the economy, it remains the top issue. And when you look at every single economic issue, whether it's rising consumer prices or whether it's interest rates, Trump beats Biden across the board. But we should note there's some caveat when you look a little bit deeper into the data that can help current President Joe Biden. One, the fact of the matter is he would just need to make up those numbers of people who voted for him in 2020 in these key states. But also the fact when you ask people how they're feeling about the economy, when they look at how the nation is, what the direction the nation is going, they don't, they find it very disappointing. But when you ask them about your own town and your own economic progress in your town, those numbers are starting to trend more positive for this president. And that's why potentially, Jonathan, with inflation coming down and an unemployment rate below 4%, when it comes to the economy, the timeline could be on Joe Biden's side going into November. Or we're just finding out it's personal, Amory. It's just personal. Potentially. I mean, when you look at people just also think that when you ask them what do they hear about President Biden, they still think that potentially he is too too old. They trust the way they felt when the when former President Trump was in office. They felt maybe they were more secure. Immigration also ranks up. Potentially it is personal. We're going to also see um, something that's going to be a problem for the president next year, fighting this impeachment inquiry in the House. What I found very interesting in this poll about one in five Democrats actually support this impeachment inquiry, but we should note um, it's going nowhere because he's not going to get convicted in the Senate, as Kaylee will tell you. Kaylee Lance will tell us that right now. Kaylee, the hits keep coming, though. Yeah, they do. If anything, this just keeps scrutiny around the president and his family in the spotlight. As Anne Marie says, this likely isn't really going to go anywhere because the Senate is never going to vote to impeach this president. And also, House moderates who are in Biden districts makes them vulnerable when it comes to reelection. May have voted to formalize this impeachment inquiry, but at the end of the day, John, what launched yesterday really is just a formalization of an inquiry. This is not an impeachment vote. That said, this vote still was done along party lines. 221 Republicans voting yay with 212 Democrats voting nay, essentially just legitimizes the process that started months ago when former Speaker Kevin McCarthy launched this inquiry without this vote. Speaker Mike Johnson, though, wanted this vote to happen uh, to make sure it stands up to scrutiny if indeed they do move forward with impeachment. Now, they're going to continue work they've already been doing, including trying to hear from members close or uh, members of the president's family very close to him. Hunter Biden, one that was in the spotlight yesterday. Of course, John, he was on the Hill publicly speaking, saying he would speak publicly in a hearing, defying calls from House Republicans to do so, to be deposed behind closed doors. And now the chairs of the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees, Je James Comer and Jim Jordan, are launching contempt of Congress proceedings for the president's son, John. Hey, Kelly, thank you. Tough times all round. Kelly Lines, thank you. Alongside Anne-Marie, shouldn't be this way. Just had another decent slate of data this morning. Jobless claims, retail sales, got the Fed chair talking up rate cuts. The economy seems to be doing OK. The equity market's near all-time highs, at or near, depending on where you look right now, going into the close a little bit later. And yet the rest of the country just does not feel it when they think about the leadership of this president in this White House. Equities right now positive by 0.5% on the S&P. Briefly, with some sector price action, here's Abby. It's impressive. A sixth up day in a, a row, John, and not surprisingly, most sectors are higher, led by real estate, looking really good as yields spiral lower. Let's take a look at a sector, though, in the month of December is doing great, and you can see lots of green there. The home builders already up 13% after gaining 20% in November. All-time high, as folks think that yields are going lower, clearly, but mortgages may go back below 7%. Abby, thank you. Your trading diary coming up next.
Look at this move right here on a small cap. The Russell up by more than 2%. Again, the S&P up a half of 1%. Let's get straight to the trading diary. What you need to be looking for over the next couple of days and into next week. Tuesday, BOJ rate decision. Wednesday, Micron reporting after the closing bell. Thursday, US GDP and another round of jobless claims. And next Friday, remember the bond market closing stateside early for the holidays. From New York City, that is it for me. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.